um, we felt we've kind of compiled um, a list of guidelines and tips based on our own experiences, um, as well as from um, some uh, ideas from the, from the internet. Um, the guidelines will be so just kind of keep in mind that um, we're coming from a specific discipline, and um, you guys need to use templates or different templates. Uh, this will give you a good start. Okay. So we're going to just start uh, with a briefing of what is an academic poster. Nikki's going to talk about what an ideal poster does, um, a typical format that is followed, and things to think about before you begin working on your poster. Um, Nikki will also talk about seven key steps for making a poster. And then later on, I will be giving some practical tips on how to use Microsoft PowerPoint in order to um, make the poster. Uh, we have some key tips on printing the poster, preparing for the conference, if you are going to be presenting it at an academic conference, as well as a brief summary. And we'll answer any questions as we go along. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or shout out from Saskatoon. Um, and, I have a question. Uh, okay. I think we're, are you going to send us your uh, PowerPoint presentation so we don't need to? Yes, we can send it to Colleen and she can send it out to everybody. So, yeah. So if you want to take notes, feel free. Um, but if if uh, not, then you can have our slides. So. I think they can see the slides. Can you see the slides okay in Saskatoon? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So I'll hand it over to Nikki. Okay, okay, so before I begin, I'm gonna just um, ask the question, who's ever made an academic poster before? So there's a few. And were these presented at conferences or for classes? For class. For class, and then were you? Conferences, okay. Okay, and so the rest I'm assuming have never made an uh, academic poster before. Okay, excellent. Okay, so what comes to mind when you think of the word academic poster? Research, right? Presenting research. Right, exactly. So it's a visual way to summarize research, not too much text. Exactly. So academic posters are commonly used in academic environments, such as conferences, to promote uh, research and promote discussion. Usually, as you can see in this picture, uh, there will be many pictures, uh, posters on display. Um, so you want yours as visually appealing as possible. And posters also can act as an introduction to both you and your research. Um, it also provides, um, when you have a poster, it also provides the opportunity to meet people who have similar interests as yours. Um, and you can get feedback uh, on your poster, which can facilitate more research for you in the future. So the ideal poster uh, is designed to provide a brief overview of your work a brief overview, so you're not going to present everything on a poster. Also, as I mentioned before, initiate discussion. So talk to people who have similar interests to you, etc. Hi there. Come on in. Um, attract attention, so it's going to be visually appealing as possible. Um, it also provides a useful tool for you to explain and discuss your research. It's really handy to have your results in tables, etc., so you can point and it makes it easier to follow. Also, posters can be used just to stand alone when you're not available um, to present them or to provide explanation. So if you're mingling in a conference, your poster should be able to tell the story of your research uh, without you necessarily being there. And lastly, researchers are, research posters are used to inform others of your particular expertise. So the typical format of a research poster that we're most familiar with is like the research poster. So we typically use um, a banner at the top with the title of your poster. So the title should invite curiosity of the viewers. Um, and then of course you have your name as well as your credentials and the name of your co-authors or supervisors if needed. Um, also the name of your institution, so if you want to use the logo or the actual name and your department. And then it moves on to, um, in this example, as you can see, is the abstract. Now, Shannon and I, in our experience, we never put the abstract on our posters. So we find it just, considering the space, there's just usually not enough room. So we usually just use an introduction 
So in the introduction, um, th this section should clearly address the question of why did you start this research? Why is it important to do it? Um, it clearly defines your topics and explains what was studied and why. And the introduction also includes uh, your research questions as well as the hypotheses. Then moving on to the method section, it's basically answering the question how you did this study. Um, so, so you should give enough detail to allow another researcher to judge whether, um, whether or not the study design was adequate to conduct this research. Also to be used to judge the validity of your results. And also in the method section, you should include um, the statistical analyses you used. Finally, uh, moving on to the results, so basically what you found. And in this section, um, you can include statistical tables, figures, et cetera, so to visually promote or um, promote your findings. And then finally, um, the discussion, so basically your interpretation of what the results mean. And you can bring in other research in this, in this section as well. And lastly, uh, the conclusions, so the general overview of your research and what you found. And you can, and this should directly relate to your studies um, research questions. So kind of just summing up everything. Now things to consider uh, before you begin. You really need to think about and consider um, the poster size. So check the website, check the poster, or the conference organizer, check with the <coughs> conference organizer in terms of width and height. So it will vary according to um, conference. We understand that you guys have a, you have a template that you're going to be using for your class, so you don't have to always think about the size, but the conferences will have different yeah. um, sizes and will tell you like whether or not it's going to be vertical or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, and if it's too big, it might not fit on the board you have, so it's really important to check this out before you begin. Um, and yeah, and also there may be regulations regarding minimum font and graphic sizes that you also might want to consider uh, before you get going. So poster size will determine basically what you can fit on the poster, uh, what you'll need to leave out if there's not enough room, uh, the layout, as Shannon mentioned, either uh, landscape or portrait, and then how things are organized. It's also very important to consider timelines. Um, in my experience, uh, posters take a long time to make. So you want a lot enough time. And you also, um, timelines are really important to consider if your poster is multi-authored. So you want to give um, the, your co-authors enough time to review and provide you with feedback and for you to address that feedback. Um, also, it's important to consider budget. Uh, posters are very expensive. Um, in our experience, it's been over $100. We get really big posters. So it's just something to keep in mind. So now I'm going to turn to um, seven general steps to consider when is to consider your audience. Who are you targeting? Who is going to be at the conference? It could be a specialist audience. So these are experts in the same or very closely related field. So in this case, they'll have a high level of knowledge um, of your subject. So it's OK to use jargon and technical terms on your topic. The next audience to consider is a related audience. So these are specialists in related or overlapping fields. So these people are generally familiar uh, with the generalities of your discipline. But be wary of specialist jargon. You want these people to know what you're talking about. So you don't want to be too specific in, in jargon terms. And lastly, a general audience. So you can only assume general knowledge with generally no familiarity in your subject area. So for this audience, I would just use basic descriptors. So step two, uh, design the layout. Uh, Shannon and I typically use um, a column format for our layout. Um, however, we recognize that there's also um, a variety of different ways you can lay out your poster, but this is the way we do it. Um, so this makes it generally very easy and simple to read. Um, this is a three-column format. Shannon's going to show a picture of a four-column format that she used, but this is an example of a three-column format. Here's one that we just found online that uses more of a diagram approach, uses bubbles to represent text, um, pictures, 
Um, but the format is still easy to follow because it's still still kind of designed in columns, but the columns are just less obvious. So um, we understand there's lots of different ways to present your research, um, but we'll just kind of be sticking to the column format for our description. Um, another thing you should consider when designing the layout is a sequence of information. Starting with the abstract and introduction and moving on through the methods and results, it kind of makes logical sense. Okay, so step two, uh, designing the layout. So use a consistent visual grammar to guide readers to the important parts of your poster. So generally, we make the title with the largest text. Uh, the subheadings, we use medium text. And for the body, we use generally the smallest text. And make sure your font sizes are consistent throughout the poster with all titles, subheadings, and body, te body text being the same size, color, and or um, bolding. <clears throat> Headings are also important to help readers find uh, main po points on your poster and to highlight key information. Also, uh, it's important to balance the placement of text and graphics to create a visual appeal. And also, we will highlight that use white space creatively to help define the flow of information. So here's some examples of how, um, how they balance text and graphics in three different ways, with horizontal symmetry, uh, horizontal and vertical symmetry, and diagonal symmetry. Just very visually aesthetic. Sometimes it's challenging, depending on your results, to do that, but mm -hmm. just kind of something to keep in mind when you are making it to try to make it look attractive. Yeah. So the reason why uh, the column format um, is so visually appealing is because it clearly shows the information has been organized within a grid design. So it's basically, we'll, we'll show you how to use grids on PowerPoint, but it, it's very straightforward and everything's even. So the boxes are even in size or, and are orientated on the page uh, at the same level. Uh, step three, uh, choose a color scheme, and this, of course, uh, varies according to preference, but generally, we try to use only two to three uh, different colors, um, plus black, which is always the best for the smallest text. It makes it mo mo most legible. And you can use color wheels to get your color scheme right, what colors go well together. Um, again, colors, colors are based on personal preference and also your supervisor's preference. <laughs> Or, or you might adhere to like the university colors. It will really depend on where you're coming from and what your supervisor prefers. Um, we come, or we, we know lab, labs in psychology that all will have to use the same colors because just to kind of all fit together. Um, but we are allowed to use different colors. Yeah, so. kind of makes it fun. <laughs> um, in my opinion, I think it's best to avoid uh, dark backgrounds uh, because lighter backgrounds are generally um, easier to read. Um, and when you use a dark background, it makes defining, designing graphics more difficult. And it also saves on ink, which is, yeah. Uh, step four, uh, formatting the type. We suggest you use a maximum of two fonts. Um, often one will do, so be very consistent with your fonts in the poster. We tend to set the headings in bold and or use a different color to kind of make them stand out, to draw the eye to them. And use italics, underlining, and capitals very sparingly. Um, in the body text, it's generally pretty distracting when you have words highlighted and underlined, etc. in the body. Uh, again, you can break up large areas of text with subheadings to make things easier to read and easier to follow. Um, in terms of text size, um, blocks of text can be easier to read by increasing the line spacing. Text should be legible at least six to 10 feet away. Um, specific font sizes, we looked on the internet for um, recommendations, but it generally depends on the size of your poster. Also, it's important to pay attention to text and sizes and figures. They also must be legible. When you have tables and you shrink them, the text can be really, really small, and it's not gonna be legible. So you, want, you don't want people squinting to read what your tables uh, say. So a helpful hint for this is if you print your poster on a regular size paper, uh, you should be able to read it uh, pretty comfortably without <laughs> bringing it to you. So that's a print test. 
Uh, step five, minimize the amount of text. We've already mentioned this, uh, but it's really important. Effective posters are generally spacious and easy to follow. Uh, they leave plenty of white space, so it's not full with um, all text or diagrams. It's very easy to follow, easy to read. Generally aim for about three to 500 words um, using a very active voice, so not passive writing. Use short, straightforward sentences. Uh, simple, simple messages are generally more memorable. And details distract from the main point and can be supply, supplied in person. They're usually there next to your poster, so if a term doesn't make sense, they can always, you can always clarify it with your reader. Um, the poster should tell part of, part of the story of your work, um, but it shouldn't be the whole, the whole story. You'll never be able to fit everything on your poster. Uh, it can be an expanded version of your abstract, um, but it will be more than this because you can present your results uh, visually uh, to support it. Um, when you minimize a text, it makes it easier for a person who is not familiar with the project to understand it quickly. They don't have to read detail by detail. It's very basic in general. So we like the idea that uh, a poster is similar to a movie trailer. So you highlight certain areas of your research in, to encourage people to find out more. It's like a teaser. <laughs> then they can ask you and you can pretend you're smart. <laughs> so step six is preparing your images. And Shannon's going to go uh, step by step through how to prepare your images. But generally, for charts, keep it simple. Um, enlarge the text again. Uh, you want them legible. And thicken the lines. Um, for instance, these aren't thick. This might, might be a little difficult to read. Uh, default formatting in PowerPoint uh, is rarely appropriate. The colors might be kind of wonky, or they might match, and it might not be very clear to read, uh, especially if you're um, adhering to a specific uh, format. Like in clinical psychology, we adhere to the APA format. Um, and you don't have to follow APA format in posters, but sometimes it, it um, sometimes... Just makes it easier to read. <laughs> yeah, conferences like to, or it's easier to read. Yeah. That's kind of what you're used to making anyways. Uh, with tables, oh, that looks funny. Uh, mm -hmm. Similar principles apply. Keep it simple. Choose formatting that will make it easier to read. So this is a default formatting, and this is just a format that I made kind of based on APA style. Uh, in terms of images, uh, they can include pictures. So use high resolution pictures. It might look okay on your computer screen, but blown up big, if it's not high resolution, it's going to look very pixelated. Um, so the ideal image resolution for posters is at least 300 pixels per square inch. Uh, if you do use Google Images, um, Shannon taught me this yesterday, <laughs> specify large size. I didn't realize you can do this, so it's very pixelated photos. Or not pixelated. Not pixelated, <laughs> right. High resolution. High resolution. Uh, or you can also use Flickr, uh, this website, which is free um, high pixel generic photographs. It's also important to include uh, your university as well as funding source logos. Um, we both got we got these both off of Google Images. This is the low resolution one, and this is the high resolution one. So you can definitely see a difference. Um, and this will definitely show up with big posters. And last but not least, review, review, review. Uh, use spell check um, with a poster when you're spending a lot of money and a lot of time on it. You don't want typos. Yeah. So <laughs> editing is key. Um, you want to parse down the information of text used. Read it again and again and again, and anything you can remove that's not relevant or significant, just get rid of it. Avoid jargon, particularly if you have a more general audience. Simplify information, and of course, ensure accurate content. Um, also, review for aesthetics. Is your poster pretty? Is it visually <laughs> appealing? Is it well organized? Does the information flow well? Um, send to peers for review. Uh, this can be very helpful. Of course, send to co-authors if you have co-authors, but just send to a buddy and see what they think. See if they understand what your, what your poster is about. And if you have a supervisor, of course, uh, send it to them. Uh, with enough notice so they are not rushed. And again, I gave this idea of test printing the document at home. Or at printing services, they offer usually a free proof of your poster, which is about this size. And you can look and see how it looks and if there's any things you missed. Um, 
So that's it for my steps. Now Shannon's going to walk you through some practical steps using PowerPoint. Great. So how familiar is everybody with PowerPoint? Pretty, pretty familiar? Okay. So we did make this fairly basic, um, and we were going to take you through some specific steps, but we'll try to keep it really specific to um, exactly how to make it more applicable for a poster as opposed to just making a regular PowerPoint presentation. So um, as Nikki discussed, the first thing that you really need to think about is the dimensions. Um, your standard slide is, is, you know, an average size for a piece of paper. So um, you'll note here on the um, page setup, you're going to want to make it so 45 inches wide, 42 inches height. That's kind of the standard R, R poster size. But this is going to depend on what is asked of you for your class or of the, the poster or the conference that you're presenting at. And here you can also select the portrait or landscape layout. Most of ours are wide, but there are definitely conferences where it'll be more of a vertical focus, and that will really change the way that you organize it. How is it laid out? In is it vertical? Okay. So we're we apologize that um, ours isn't exactly how you guys will be presenting yours, but it'll give you a start anyway. Um, so, um, the background color scheme is going to be really important. Um, what we have found is that colors show up very differently on your computer um, as compared to at the printer. Um, so we'll show you some examples because <laughs> we have our actual posters and then like on PowerPoint and then we'll show you pictures of us with them and they're not the same. So um, you really want to be selective about your colors and you may already told what colors to use so this isn't a big deal, but down the road this might be something that, that comes up. So um, just one second, I, I'm just going to take you through, um, here we are on PowerPoint. Um, in order to um, change, actually, here we are, uh, in order to change the background color, Oh, this is an old version of PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, good. So this is going to change things. So depending on the version of PowerPoint, things are going to be under different um, headings. So we might have to play around here a bit. Uh, yeah. Sure. If you had a printer on the printer, mm -hmm. would that color be closer to what the post outcome would be? What we find is it will really depend on where you actually get your print, your poster printed finally. So um, if you go to printing services, when you, um, when you have a final poster, you go to printing services, they will print off a proof, and they generally will try to do it on the exact same printer that they would print the large-scale poster on. What we have found is sometimes that large-scale printer isn't working. So they'll print it off a different printer, and then it won't be the same. So that's just the challenges that you kind of come across those practical issues. Yeah. Just to give you everyone, you can actually pick your color setting in PowerPoint and then drop it in your unit. Mm -hmm. It's CYMK because that's the same color code that you get from the front. Okay. Oh. That'll actually guarantee color matching. Okay. It won't be perfect, but it'll be within two bits. It'll be more accurate. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, so they, these are just kind of things to think about um, when you're making it. There's a color scheme over there. Okay. So um, no, that's not what we want. So if you go to, um, yeah, we totally prepared this for Microsoft 7, <laughs> or for PowerPoint yeah. 2007. So uh, here we are. So if you go to Format and Background, um, this is where you can select your colors. Um, we tend to choose, you know, whatever, it depends on the color that you're going to be using for your, uh, do you want to say something, Serena? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So, that's where you so there's that no option in that. <laughs> okay. It might be in the new ones. Okay. Yeah. So most of us are probably working off of 2007. Um, so this kind of sucks. <laughs> I guess this isn't gonna follow exactly. And we already prepared all the steps, so we wouldn't be playing around with this. <laughs> but uh, anyhow. Um, there's also um, fill effects, which we find can be appealing. So some supervisors don't mind if you can't if you want to change it around. Um, and basically, it just changes the gradients of the way that the colors are presented. So this is quite dark, um, but you can change it. On the new PowerPoint, there's a transparency option, 
And so maybe you might have a, a really dark color for the borders around it, but you want it to be lighter where the text is. You can change the gradient of the color um, and the way it's organized. So I'll just select um, this one. You can kind of see in the background. The color is not obvious because it's a white column. Is that? But uh, you can play around with the colors depending on, on the way you want to do that. And unfortunately, it's just organized differently in PowerPoint 2007. So you just have to figure out where that is. We have the actual steps in our, our PowerPoint slide, so you can just follow that. Um, okay. Here we are. So he, this is how it appears in 2007, um, where you have the gradient fill. You can also use a picture in the background. Um, <coughs> that is often used, but sometimes, depending on the conference that you're at, you might have a, if you were like in biology, for instance, you might have a picture of a cell or something like that, or um, you might have clouds or, you know, just depending on, on where you're presenting, whether or not that's appropriate or not. Um, so yeah, these are, this is what the, the actual thing would look like in 2007. Um, okay, so formatting and organizing your poster. So we're doing ours in landscape format, and we're just gonna show you a demonstration of how to make columns and add text, that sort of stuff. So, um, we recommend, oh no, the formatting's changed. <laughs> uh, here we are. Okay, so here is actually a fairly ugly poster um, <laughs> with uh, three columns. So in order to, uh, what you can do after you've actually made your first column, you can just copy and paste it and use the same column for all of it so that they're all the same size. But we're gonna pretend that we don't have any other columns. And we, t we tend to use a table format in order to do this. So this table doesn't look anything like the other columns. We're gonna move it around, line it up, and um, we like, well, at least I like to use a white background in my in my tables in order so that the text shows up better. Um, but this is different. Like Nikki doesn't necessarily do that with hers. Um, but if you wanted to change the background, um, you would double click on the table. Uh, this changes the border. If you want to add a border to it, the fill. I want a white fill. There we go. So simple as that. Um, you can actually insert text right directly into the table, but I find it's really hard when you are editing uh, because then everything's gonna move around differently. So we like to insert text boxes directly in there. And you can type in your, your heading. You can move it around better. Let's say um, your results ends up going over into the other um, column, at least you can move it around. But if you insert it directly into the table, then it's just gonna be really fussy to have to deal with. And what I like to do is I like to insert a different text box for the actual body, so that if my headings move and I wanna change the format, it's just easier that way. So, um, yeah, so just having um, body of discussion in a different um, text box. Find that works better. Okay. Does everyone understand how to make columns? Okay. So one thing that we find really key um, is grid lines. Um, this is something that not everybody knows about, um, but it, it can be really important. So on Microsoft 2007, you'll go under the view tab and grid lines will be something that you can check off. And I don't know if you can see this closely, but there's uh, lines that appear on your slide. And uh, so we'll try to find it in the old PowerPoint. Let's see here. Good uh, lines. Here we are. So under View, Grid, and Guides, display grid on on screen. So what you can do with it is. This is where posters can get really, really nitpicky because you want it to look good and you want it to be even, you want everything to be um, precise. So right now we're zoomed in only 14%. Let's make it big. What you can tell by making it bigger, by zooming in, is that the lines aren't even. 
this is shorter than this column. So when you have grid lines, you can make it easy by either moving around the grid to match up a line and so on. The other thing that you can use grid lines for, uh, let's see here, is um, you want to have the border around the poster even all the way around. So I like to put at least one grid line row or column as a border, just so that it's not like you have text going all the way to the end or um, all over the poster. You want to have a nice border. And that is also why you want to use a color in the background. You want to make it look good. So what you want to do, and this is tedious, you want to count the amount of um, rows or columns um, in the grid to make sure that it's even on each side, as well as even in between the columns, even um, around the banner, and so on. So you want to make everything line up on the exact same grid line. Um, and when you zoom in, it's a lot easier to actually see how well you're actually doing that. Uh, so yeah, you would kind of line it up. You might do it halfway in between the grid or you might do it exactly on the grid line just to make it easier. This is our fun study that we like to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, are, is there any questions about, about the kind of that nitpicky aspect of making a poster? Nope. Okay. For some reason, our formatting got really screwed up on here. But um, okay, so formatting the text on the slide is as simple as using Microsoft Word or making a PowerPoint presentation. So we're not going to go through um, all of the steps of doing that. But um, as Nikki highlighted, you're going to want to use different fonts. Um, <coughs> You may want to use different fonts for the titles and the headings, and then use like a plain font for the body of the text. So Arial or Times New Roman or something like that. Something a little bit more, people are used to reading it. You can get a little bit more fancy with the titles if you want to draw attention. Center the headings um, just for the look of it. Um, we find that we either bold or and or underline headings. And then we use bullet points in the text. So um, just like making a regular PowerPoint presentation. Um, we find that it looks better if you justify the margins of your text, um, which I assume everyone knows how to justify um, based on Microsoft Word. Um, so that's just something that we find makes it look better. At least all of the text is lined up in the columns that we use. But it will depend on the format that you use. And we, when we present our research, uh, we often have different measures that we're having participants complete or different ways of measuring things, we tend to highlight those or italicize those in order to draw attention to that, the fact that we're actually using a standardized measure. Um, but this will depend on what you're actually uh, presenting in your poster. Um, I think tables and charts are the most finicky thing that you will have to work with with making a poster because as Nikki mentioned before, the uh, font is often really small. You're trying to fit a lot of numbers into a small area. And you also want to make it look good. So this is something I'll kind of give you a little bit more instruction on. Here we are. Uh, OK. I'm just going to turn those grid lines off. Uh, there they are. OK. So here is an example of a table. Um, remember to include a title in your table. Um, at least that's what we do. Um, I'm not sure if that's required for you guys. Um, so we're just presenting simple correlations in this title, or in this table. So we'll zoom in a little bit so you can see that better. Um, one thing that we found in order to use your space best, you don't need to repeat the names of variables that you're using. So we've labeled the temperature outside as label one, the wind chill factor as a variable two, and the fear of freezing your eyebrows in uh, variable three. And instead of repeating that in the upper columns, we've used one, two, and three. And that just allows you to not have to cram all of that text into those things. So these are just kind of some simple things to think about when you're um, including all of this information to a table. So um, how to make a table in this, you go to insert, insert your table. You want to decide on the number of columns and rows. It's going to come out really big and ugly, so you're going to want to change the size in order to fit it into your column. 
if you wanted to put a title in the top row, you're going to need to merge the cells. So you highlight the cells, right click, and put merge cells. And then that way, you can write table one and the title. Um, and so it's as simple as that. Um, but the thing is, is that it's hard to really demonstrate this in a presentation, but you're going to have probably more than three variables that you're presenting. Um, you may not necessarily be presenting correlations. You might be presenting a regression or a model. Um, so this is just kind of more of a basic table that you'd be using. Pardon? There's a question. Oh, yeah, question. Is it easier to make your tables and your charts in PowerPoint, or would it be easier to make them in, say, Excel and import them in? Well, um, when you try to make a chart in PowerPoint, it'll automatically bring up an Excel mm -hmm. document. So, um, yeah, you will be using Excel with what we find is that um, you can make it in Word. Um, if you then copy and paste it into uh, PowerPoint, you'll have to stretch it out. And sometimes the graphics don't come up as well or the color scheme doesn't come up. So you can kind of play around with it, like trial and error it a bit. Um, we've generally used, just made it directly in PowerPoint. Once you make one, that's the thing, is once you make one, you kind of have something to work off of. And so the next time you make a poster, um, you know what worked and you know what didn't, and you can um, kind of copy over it or play around with it or add columns if you need it. Um, the other thing is we use this column format, and sometimes it's hard to fit it all in, in there. So you might instead have an introduction column and a discussion column and leave out, instead of having borders around, that way you can use the space a little bit better to expand out um, the tables in order to fit it in. Are there any other questions? So the other thing um, is to have a little note under your table to denote the statistical significance value that you used. Um, you don't necessarily have to report that in the body of the text, but just to indicate that maybe this, um, this was correlated, you have a little star beside. So it's just the same as if you were presenting it in a journal. Try to keep it consistent. So as I mentioned, um, if you were to create a chart, um, Excel will pop up. So you use the same insert tab as where you would go to uh, create a table. And with the Microsoft 2007, there's all sorts of different options. This is a basic bar graph, but there are so many other options you can create that are 3D. Um, you can use pie charts, all that. So it'll really depend on the content of the data that you're wanting to present and um, how it will be best represented. Um, so we, uh, we either tend to use like a basic chart or um, a standard table to present our, our results or models. So it'll just depend. Um, and we have the specific steps in here for the regular, for the 2007 uh, PowerPoint. So you guys can use that. Ah. <laughs> All right, are there any specific, any more specific questions on how to use PowerPoint? No? Okay, so printing the poster. Um, I think it's absolutely key to have it finished at least one week before going to a conference or for handing it in or presenting it in your class. Um, this can account for, for instance, printers being broken, um, having to use backup plans. So um, you can go and print your, your posters at other places. Um, we use really large posters, so printing service is usually the best option for us because most places don't have um, the size printer that we need. But if you're using you know, a vertical poster, it might be easier to take it to Staples and it might be more affordable that way. Um, as Nikki's mentioned before, it's really key to ask for a proof. And this will help you to notice, like sometimes the formatting transfers differently as this whole presentation happened. Everything, the formatting got screwed up. Um, things will pop out of columns, your models won't line up right, and then the colors are screwed up. So, when you have a proof, you can at least know that this is how it's going to show up when you make when you pay the hundred and some dollars to have it printed. Um, and yeah, you can shop around. I don't know what other than Staples what there is in Regina um, for poster printing, but um, just think there are other options. Out there. Uh, one thing that uh, students often forget is if you are traveling to a conference, it's important to buy or borrow a poster carrying tube. So it look, looks a little bit like a bazooka. You will get weird eyes when you're on the airplane. But um, 
this is just something to keep and protect your poster. We've had people show up and present next to us um, in San Francisco when it was pouring rain, and they had walked a few blocks in order to get to the hotel. And what a waste of money, what a waste of time, you know, because it was just soaked. So um, you can get, often you can get just regular tubes at Staples, but um, I'm not sure where you actually buy these particular ones. I think ones. you can get them at Staples. At Staples, yeah. yeah. So, so that's really important if you're going to be doing a lot of conferencing. Um, if you're doing a PhD or if you're planning on to be um, an academic in the long run, it's worth investing. I think they're 25 bucks or something like that. Um, when you're uh, presenting your poster, um, often people will come around and they may not necessarily have time to read your entire poster while you're there. So what we like to do is we print off mini copies of the poster. So you can get printing services to do this. It'll be a little bit smaller than you probably would, have, would like, but at least they'll have your information there. And business cards are really key. If you have business cards or little pieces of paper with your contact information, people will often be like, yeah, I really want to talk about this. I've, I've already done some research in this area. Maybe I can give you some tips. Or maybe they want to cite your, your poster and they want some more information on the larger study that you conducted. Um, we like to provide like an 8 by 11 envelope. We tack it up wherever you're presenting it and tuck the poster in. So just in case uh, you have to step away from your poster, uh, maybe you're, you're talking with uh, somebody who's presenting beside you because you're presenting similar research. Um, they can just come by and grab a copy. We ideally would like you to stand by the poster and make sure that you're there to answer questions um, as opposed to let your poster just do all the work. Um, some places may not provide um, tax or sticky tack in order to post your poster. Most places will. Um, but some places that are maybe less organized um, may not provide that sort of stuff. So it's best to have backup just in case you need to hang your poster. Uh, know your poster, dress the part. You know, if you're at a professional conference, you probably shouldn't wear jeans like we are. Um, but you know, dress nicely. You want to be able to answer questions. Um, prepare, like at least for us, we present at very specialized conferences. So it's very likely that the people that we're citing in our introduction could walk by and uh, ask us questions. So it's good to know who the people are that do your research so that you're not explaining their theory to them. <laughs> That's always fun. Um, rather, they probably already know it, so you want to target the way that you answer questions um, specific to your audiences. Gauge how much they might know about your area of research when they ask questions, and then you kind of know what to say. So um, we're just going to show you some sample posters of what we have recently presented at a conference in San Francisco, and also give two poster examples of perhaps what to do and perhaps what not to do, just to give you guys um, a good eye for critiquing what a good poster looks like. So here is uh, Nikki's poster. Okay, yeah, this is my poster that, like Shannon said, I presented at ABCT in San Francisco this year. Um, I'm not too keen on the color, <laughs> to be honest with you. I don't know if I would have chose it again, but what I like about this poster is I presented a model here of health anxiety, um, and I presented a nice table that's pretty easy to read, I think. Um, presented some pictures, uh, a visual representation of this continuum I was talking about. Um, ways I could improve would perhaps, again, be to reduce the text. It's, there's a lot of text here. Try not to do full paragraphs like I did. Um, it's just lots to read, and most people won't read it. Uh, but that was my poster I presented. Is there any questions on that? Keep in mind, ours are giant. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're really big, so. They're ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Um, so this is the poster that I presented, a little bit um, more visual. There's a little bit more uh, models being used. Um, we tried to use. Um, less than full sentences, but sometimes it's just really challenging sometimes when you're trying to explain a point. Um, they do recommend just limiting like straightforward bullet points. Um, I used a different font for the uh, titles and headings and kept it to a plain font for the body of the text. One thing that we didn't mention is that if you are going to a conference, we do like to include at the bottom, I know it's here, yeah. 
very small text that says the poster was presented at the 44th Annual Convention of the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapy, November 2010. So just, um, you're not supposed to present your poster at more than one place. Uh, so if you put that on there, at least, you know, we often hang our posters in hallways or in lab space so that when people come by, they can be like, oh, that's where that was presented. Um, that's not necessary, but um, it's something that's nice to do. I included uh, the university logo as well as my funding logo here. Um, the I really like the color in that it, in how it's presented here, but as I sh I'll show you later on, the live version was a little bit more purpley and pinky than I would have liked. So that was the incident where the printer um, wasn't working when I got my proof, and it didn't kind of uh, go as well as I wanted. It wasn't terrible, but it wasn't exactly what I was looking for. Um, you can get a little bit fancy with the models. Um, I use like a more of a radiant look where there's colors on the outside. And it, it's really up to you what you want to do, but but uh, that's how that is presented. So I used a four column format, and as I mentioned, I like to use a white background on my columns, but that's not necessary. So what does everyone think of this? Poster. Busy? Yeah. So this is an astrophysics poster um, that we just found on the internet. So we were going to blank out the author, but <laughs> you, you can find it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this poster? Part of me. Too many colors. Yeah. Too many words. Too many letters. Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What so, about the number of diagrams and figures? Yeah. You think you think someone's gonna read each one of them? <laughs> you can hardly even read what you know what, what they what, say. What the yeah. Say. The other thing is like the use of orange text and red text and green text. Uh, we're not really sure what that what the point of that is. Is it highlighting something? Um, it's just too much of it to actually have it stand out. There's no clear organization of it. Um, it doesn't flow. Um, we can't even really tell. It says introduction up there, but it seems to go across as opposed to down, and some goes across and some goes down. So yeah, this was a perfect example of what not to do. <laughs> uh, the text is very small and it's very text heavy. Um, so uh, we also know here that they did use references and acknowledgments. Um, that's something that you may or may not include just depending on the conference or on what's required for your class. Um, we generally won't include references. Um, we might include them more on the mini handout that we give to people so that if they want, they can look it up. Um, but it's really, most people aren't gonna want the references. And um, acknowledgements, if you need to take up the space, you know, obviously you should, but it's not necessary. Yeah? Just for the references, I know you said you don't necessarily include like the references section where this mm -hmm. comes up, but would you have your in-text citation? Absolutely, so, absolutely. Okay, and then if someone needs the full bibliography, Exactly, yeah. So if you're organized, you're going to have that prepared already. So you're going to include your references um, perhaps on the other side of the poster printout. Most people aren't that picky um, that come by. They're really just interested in hearing about your research. Um, but if, you, if they absolutely want them, that's when you would get their email address and you can always send it to them when you return home from your conference. So yeah, are there any other kind of specific questions like that? So what does everyone think of this poster? What are some positives? Hmm? It's organized. It's organized. Yeah. It's nicely organized. So there's a nice layout with a nice flow. Yeah. What about the colors? The colors seem to work for it. I think the colors are not bad. Yeah. And I like how they um, highlighted the background and the, the, the major headings and color, you can do that too. We didn't do that in our presentations, but that, that's a nice look too, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we learned is that um, we, we might adhere to a particular format, but um, there's lots of ideas out there. If you Google images, conference poster presentations, you'll get some good ones and you'll get some not so good ones, but it'll help you to figure out if you want to format it um, against a template that you may already have. I see a question over here. Nope, okay. Do you guys have any questions, Saskatoon? Nope. All 
All right. So uh, we really liked the use of bullets. They justified the text. They used images, but it wasn't excessive. It really helped to um, show exactly what they're what they're doing. They did have an acknowledgement section. They had a, a further work or future research section. Um, with the university logo. University logos, as well as um, you know everyone that was involved in it and who was. So, um, in summary, um, poster presentations are an opportunity to clearly and effectively communicate the results of your research. As you can see here, mine was very purple in the middle, <laughs> um, which didn't necessarily uh, come up on the PowerPoint slide. And mine was very pink. Yeah. That wasn't planned, I swear. That wasn't the one you showed, right? No, oh. no. Yeah. There's lots of jokes made about the pink poster, because <laughs> uh, that's generally not a professional color that you want to present with, but um, on PowerPoint it didn't necessarily up that way. Mm -hmm. So um, this was us in San Francisco. Is this you in San Francisco? Uh, I think so. Yeah. 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 So, um, but basically, uh, posters provide you with an opportunity to discuss your research, attract um, people. I find that a lot of people will come by and say, oh, did you use, did you ever consider this measure in your research? And I'll be like, no, I haven't considered that. Maybe that'll be something I do in a follow up study. Um, or maybe they'll just provide you with um, other areas of research to check into that might be applicable to it. Um, the more specialized the conference I find, the more likely you're going to get that really specific feedback. General conferences where it's very multidisciplinary, um, even a conference where there are psychologists that aren't just in a clinical setting that are organizational psychologists or educational or developmental, you're, it's still kind of more of a generalist presentation um, and you're not necessarily going to get people that really know a lot about what you do. So um, so depending on how much interest, that will really depend on how much people are interested in what, you're, what you do. So, are there any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, how much do you use images? Like I know in the posters you showed us of yours, you used mostly models or diagrams. Mm -hmm. And then I know in the other poster we looked at at the end that they were mm -hmm. using like actual photos. Yeah. So how much should you be using photos versus diagrams or anything yeah. besides text in your poster? I think it really depends on what you're presenting. Mm -hmm. um, in like qualitative research, which I meant to find an example of a qualitative study that I had done. Um, I used both like a model to represent my research and then I also used pictures because it was um, it just the, the, the nature of the project really lent itself well to using that. Um, sometimes people will take pictures of their apparatus that they're using when they're setting, like for instance, like if we're using scientific um, instruments or anything like that, they might take a, an example picture of an experiment or a pretend participant. And that kind of helps to really demonstrate like what a participant might go through if they were in your study. Um, granted, you guys are probably doing research that's very different, um, and it may be more epidemiological research, or you know, you're using StatsCan data. Pictures may not necessarily um, be available to represent it, but if you can get creative and you can use a high-quality resolution photo, then it just helps to take away from the amount of text that you're using. It draws attention. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Ahead, yeah. Do you have any recommendations on fonts? I read a lot of conflicting things about whether, say, things like serifs or sans serifs are better, more readable, or more professional looking. So, mm -hmm. is there anything in your guys' experience with any? We don't have necessarily specific guidelines. Um, mm. Serena, are there guidelines for the class? Sans serif fonts is what they said, Saskatoon, just so you know. Um, they, we, I, I, like, I like to get a little bit more creative with my headings, um, just because I find if it's all the same font, it kind of can look dull, but um, do what your course outline says. <laughs> it's okay, yeah. But, yeah, you will get conflicting information, even in preparing this, we kind of checked a few different websites for some recommendations, yeah. and some say, you know, you should be able to read it 20 feet away, and others are like six feet away is more ideal. Um, so you really, um, it's an art, not yeah, exactly. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. What's the smallest font size you can use? Uh, so can I roll a thumb on that? Sure. Let me just. Yeah. Let me just bring up um, one of the uh, posters that we would have done. Um, okay.
So this is the one that I was showing you guys. Um, the body font was 37, um, and that was, would have been the smallest font that I would have used. Um, even the titles under the figures was font size 37, and the title was 75, um, and the subheadings were 45 level font. So keep in mind this was a large poster. Um, you may not necessarily be able need it to be that yeah, big. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so 100% <laughs> size, like this is how big we're talking when you're actually looking at it in person. So, mm -hmm. so I would probably limit it to like 25 to 30 for body text, if at all possible. Yeah. Anything else? I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Why did you use PowerPoint instead of Word? That's just what we've been trained on. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it's basically um, from the beginning. I've been using PowerPoint since 2003 to make presentations. Um, so, yeah, that's just kind of what's standard in our discipline. But it, people use different things. Yeah. Oh, okay. And the template that the students are going to be given here is will be through PowerPoint. So, yeah. Sorry, I saw another question before. No? All right. Okay. Thanks. So. Well, thank you, and if uh, we'll send the presentation to Colleen, um, hopefully this afternoon, and have it sent with you guys. I just want to that's really great, just take a moment yeah. to uh, thank our speakers for, for taking time out of the day to come and teach us. So I just have a token from the school for you guys. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I'll, if everybody registered who's here today and in Saskatoon and all, make sure you get the presentation probably on Monday. Um, and if you have any other questions that maybe wasn't addressed, you can let me know and I can forward hmm. them on or anything. So thanks for coming today. All right. Thank you. You know, when it kept it for saying, political economy, 806, and um, finance. Hey, I was depending on you. Now I understand what you're talking about. Is that the little, like a poster? I think all of them are sending posters. I thought it was just to advertise. Don't be publicized that you're having a big sale or something. Well, you know, that's a well seen at least. You make them do a poster? Yes. Wow. I think it's important. Well, it's nothing, it's nothing fancy, right? I just that's a good, want that's them good. getting used to yeah, these kinds of things because, I mean, it's becoming more and more, totally. right? Conferences don't want to give as much speaker space. It's an easy way. You don't have to give speaker space, and you can get a whole bunch of extra I was saying to Shannon, I never did a poster in my undergrad. Yeah. So I think it's I, great. I only did it because of my honors class. Thanks. Because of the lab I was in, they did posters. Well, I think my kids are all business anyway, but I still think it's a good way to do visual media and really get them on board with graphical yeah. representation of data. Yeah. Sure. Anyway, well, thank you. You're welcome. No problem. Yeah. Yeah. Thank
So I'm not trying to change Twitter, it's upstairs.